We need to get this better understanding of what is your job. Your job is to put something in your mouth, and when it's in your mouth, you have one other job, and that's bring it to your person and hold on to it. All right, guys, welcome back. Another podcast episode here for you. Going to jump right into it. This is going to be a question that I got um, via email. Um, it's this, this episode is going to be, um, we've done a bunch of them like this, where it's questions that we get, whether it be Facebook, Instagram, email, um, various ways that you guys can get a hold of us. Um, doing my best to keep up with that, and that is always a challenge, and it continues to be. But I thought I'd jump into this one because this is a question that uh, it's an often asked about topic, hold conditioning, force fetch, trained retrieve, um, call it whatever you want. There's uh, lots of different approaches to it. And so I, I really believe in the idea that I don't think uh, force fetch or trained retrieve is, is necessary. Um, 99.99% of the time, I won't say every time, but, um, it's, but it's also, I think it's a gateway to, um, a style of training. So I think that makes sense if you're going to look at using, um, more pressure or force in your training, um, journey. So it, 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 it is a thing that, you know, it's aversion training. So it's a dog's going to behave with the understanding that if it doesn't, it's going to, it's going to hurt. Um, and I don't like that personally. So, um, let's get, so this question is specific to it. It's, I'll read it to you and then I'll kind of go into my answer. It says, I've watched a bunch of your hold conditioning videos and I like the process. I noticed that in almost all cases you put the bumper or the bird in the dog's mouth. At what point do you want, do you ask or want the dog to reach for the bumper or bird? And how do you teach that? I have a GSP pup that is bumper crazy and could play fetch all day. She's also bird crazy and wants to chase them all day, but doesn't particularly like picking up birds. She seems more interested in licking the bird and plucking off feathers with her teeth. If possible, I would like to avoid an ear pinch or a toe hitch method. Any suggestions? Is there a video or particular in particular that I should be watching? Thanks again, Guido. So Guido, great question. Um, there's multiple answers to that question. So I'll, I'll take it from the beginning here. Um, at what point do you ask or want the dog to reach for the bumper or bird and how do you teach that? I don't. Um, I think that there's some confusion in the idea of what hold conditioning, what we're actually after. And I feel like I got a puppy here kind of getting loud behind me. So I'm going to correct him quick. So um, this is a good example of real life. I've got f five dogs laying by me here. One of them Blue is, uh, you know, getting kind of wound up on his bed. So we're going to firm up, tell him that's enough, and we'll see how that goes. So you get double training here. Um, so the answer is I don't teach a retriever to retrieve. So I'm going to go a little bit further into your message here, and it says, I have a GSP pup that is bumper crazy, could play fetch all day. So hold conditioning doesn't teach dogs to retrieve. Um, it teaches the idea of what the delivery should look like. It completes it. Um, I don't teach dogs to retrieve. I think that if you have to force fetch, meaning, you know, you could break that word down and it's been used lots of different ways and I don't, that's fine. But the idea of forced fetch, if you really break up, break down the definition of that, you're, are you forcing the dog to fetch? Is that, is that the idea behind it? Trained to retrieve. Are you training the dog to retrieve? I personally think that that's probably a big red flag. If we have to train retrievers to retrieve, if we have to force retrievers to fetch. Um, I just don't think that makes much sense. It would be similar to if you said the trained point or the forced point with a pointer. I think that that doesn't make much sense. I think pointers point, retrievers retrieve we ask them to do it in a certain way at some point in our training. I totally think that that ha is something that we do. I think that um, it's been done for a long, long time. 
as far as like the shaping specifically of how we want them to do it. Uh, and it in that's on the micro and the macro. So I think that, you know, some people with a point uh, and now I'm talking some pointer stuff because I'm, I'm right in the belly of that beast right now. I've got this six month old, six, six and a half months old now, uh, setter that's really been an interesting eye opening process and has made me, um, a lot feel a lot more comfortable thinking about things like trained retrieve force fetched hold conditioning like i think there's a lot of um similarities they're different they're differences obviously like retriever versus pointer but there's a lot of overlapping things when it comes to training dogs regardless of style or breed and so when it comes so I, i'm going to use the stuff that i've been exposed to and been thinking an awful lot about with pointing dogs to kind of explain that a little bit. I have yet to find a, a trainer that I'm trying to get resources and information from. Um, I've yet to find one that says you should be, you know, you need to train your dog to point or you need to teach the dog to point or you need to force the dog to point. I think that I've not found that. I think it's a really accepted idea that pointers point and you bring it out of them. I also think that there are variations to what degree. I think some people are very happy with, so that that's a loaded question, like pointing. Does that mean flash pointing and then flushing? Does it mean pointing and holding until we flush and then breaking? Does it mean pointing, holding till we flush, holding till we shoot the gun and then break? Does it mean point, hold, Pass the flush, pass the shot, pass the fall. You hit the bird, it goes down, and then you let the dog go. Like those are all different levels of it. Um, after a certain point, no pun intended there, but after a certain point when it comes to pointing, there has to be some involvement with us as a trainer. And that's a process that, you know, I'm, I'm tiptoeing my way through right now. I'm trying to figure out a little bit. I think that with retrieving, it's very similar in the idea that retrievers retrieve. And I encourage us to tap into that, bring it out, bring it out appropriately, shape it accordingly when they're young, um, set them up for success. Just like I set up my pointer for success, I put her in front, I give her opportunities. I put her in front of some birds and I let that natural thing happen. With a retriever, I set them up for success. If the issue is, so in this specific in issue, it sounds like uh, she will, she's also, she retrieves bumpers like crazy and could fetch all day. She's also bird crazy. Now this is a GSP. So we got like a dog that's kind of halfway here. We got one that, we got a dog that is a pointer and a retriever. Like that, that's the idea with that versatile breed. So she'll also re She's also bird crazy and wants to chase them all day, but doesn't particularly like picking up birds. She seems more interested in licking the bird, plucking the feathers with her teeth. So I don't see this. I think this is a totally different. The answer is not directly connected to force fetch, trained retrieve, hold conditioning. I, I think you've got a retriever, it sounds like. So she's bumper crazy and can play fetch all day. That's good. How is that look? Does it look like, does she deliver it and hold it for you? Because that's what hold conditioning does for me. Does she run out and get it for you when you throw it? If you set up a memory for her, if she flushes and, and, you know, let's say you launch something for her at a distance, does she mark? Those are all parts of a retrieve. When you think of what a retrieve is, there's lots of parts to the retrieve. As simple as a retrieve is, there's the part of the dog recognizing the object, whether it be visual whether it be set up as a memory, however you however you set this up for the dog. There's the object itself. There's the idea of going to get the object. There's the idea of picking the object up and bringing it back to you. And then there's the idea of finishing, which means holding on to it until you say you want that object. So those are all parts of it. It sounds like what I'm reading, you don't have an issue with the dog going out to make retrieves. It, if if I have a GSP pup that is bumper crazy and could play fetch all day, she's also bird crazy and wants to chase them all day, doesn't particularly like picking up birds. To me, you don't have a retrieving issue. You might have an issue with a dog 
picking up birds so that I would, I would, I would approach that differently of, well, that's at first, I think you have to assess this, the problem. And to me, that's what it is. The idea of at what point do you ask the dog to reach for the bumper or bird? I don't, because I think now you're talking and I, I, I Guido, I think it's a great question because I think there's a lot of, I've had this people, people ask me this a lot. When do you teach that dog to, to, um, take it from you? When do you teach the dog to reach out and grab it? When do you teach the dog? To, well, I can't get my dog to pick it up off the table. I, they, I, I, I've had people send me videos of them wanting to know why, why their dog won't grab their hand. And I'm like, well, why would they grab your hand? So I think there's a lot of confusion with some of the force fetch, trained retrieve techniques and styles and what we're calling hold conditioning. I don't want the dog impulsively grabbing stuff out of people's hands. I, do, I think that is an undesirable habit. I certainly wouldn't encourage it. In fact, I would discourage it. So I think I know that we see this happen with force fetch. We see we want the dogs to reach out and grab it from our hand. Then we want them to reach out and grab it from the ground. Then we want them to reach it out and grab it from 10 yards and then from 15 yards and from 20 yards. And how do we do it? We apply pressure to them until they do that. And it makes it, so it makes it uncomfortable until they do what we want them to do. And then we turn that pressure off, whether it's pinching their ears or their toes or however people want to do it. And to me, I look at that and I go, well, what is that fixing? Like, what is that? What, where is, if we have a problem with a dog that doesn't want to retrieve, I guess that would be a technique to get the dog to retrieve. But I question how many retrievers don't retrieve. And if you have one that doesn't retrieve, I think that's your biggest problem. Like that's like me taking a pointer that doesn't want a point that doesn't have natural point that doesn't have any instinct to want to go do that and thinking that I can pinch your ear until you give in to what I'm asking you to do, which is point a bird. Like, I just don't see that happening. I would never go through it. If I had a pointer that didn't point, I'd go get a different pointer. If I had a retriever that didn't retrieve, I'd go get a different retriever. But I think that What's interesting is, is that we're talking about retrievers here, and I would argue that very few to none of them won't retrieve. I do think we have to figure out how to get it out of them. And to me, that's the fun part, because I think it's turn it into a game when they're young, foster it, shape it. And you can do it with older dogs too, but I think it's a lot easier when they're young. Because you you have a pretty blank slate there that you're really tapping into some natural things that the dog has. It's been bred into him for a long time. We had a we had a dog this weekend. We had a workshop this weekend. They were all retrievers. It was the first time we didn't have a pointing breed in probably three or four years. They were all retrievers with the exception of we had a little beagle. And the little beagle was one of the best retrieving dogs in the group. Like probably one of the most natural. They weren't even going to... They were, they were here to teach the dog... Ultimately, their end goal is a super nice family. They're from uh, Michigan, they came from. And they had a dog that they wanted to develop to be a tracker, game finder, game recovery. And so we did some drills with tennis balls. We did some hunt commands. We did some retrieving drills. And that little dog had as much or more natural instinctive retrieve in it than any of the retrievers that were here. And I thought that was real interesting. And I thought it was a perfect example of uh, it's not a retriever and it retrieves really well. I've seen a lot of beagles retrieve well. I've seen a lot of shepherds and Malinois and um, name one, name another one that isn't a retrie- isn't a natural retrie- I've got a setter right now. I've got a setter that makes a really nice retrieve, much better on the tennis ball outside than anything. But in the house with a dummy, she's really good. Um, her struggle is when she gets distracted, when there's there's outside influence things that get in her way. So she's not a retriever. She's a natural pointer. And I saw that. I, I, She's pointing. And I didn't train her to point. I gave her opportunities. I didn't train her to retrieve. I gave her opportunities. The beagle didn't get trained to retrieve. We gave it opportunities and it latched onto this game. And so I don't believe in the idea of turning this into an impulsive act because I think it's I think it's silly and I think it's actually counterproductive because I see it, you know, again, it goes back to the full circle of 
how are you going to train the rest of your training with your retriever? I don't do force to pile. So I don't do force to anything when it comes to retrieving. Now, I'm not going to go into that because it's talking about a lot of stuff that doesn't have to do with this. But if you plan on doing retriever training with that style, I think it's probably necessary and a real good place to start is by force fetching the dog because you're really teaching the dog to get a learning style is what it is. It's learn to do something by avoiding the wrong thing, which gets pressure. And I, I mean, if you don't, if you don't know what force fetch is, just Google it and watch. I'm uncomfortable with it. I don't like it. I don't think it, I, I, I like hold conditioning because by the time I'm done with hold conditioning, so we don't, so that getting back to your specific answer, I don't teach the dogs to do that. Instead, I put the dummy in their mouth and I start it with the idea of once you have this in your mouth, now what? And the reality of what I'm trying to accomplish is I can't set this thing down anymore. I can't set it. It's in my mouth. I can't set it down until I bring it back to them, bring it back to him, which is me. Dogs got it. So in the dog's mind, it's, I've got this in my mouth because I've been bred to be a retriever and we set it up as a memory or a mark or whatever it is. And I, I did what I do. I run out and I get stuff. And, and most people are listening to this are going to say, yeah, my dog does that. No problem. It's getting them to come back. That's the issue. That's where hold conditioning has value to me. Um, there's other symptoms that it, it brings value, you know, blinking on dummies. Um, I, we're posting a series right now with chief Mason's dog chief. Um, really nice dog, uh, did, trained him for like a week while he, my son was on uh, spring break. Had a lot of fun with the dog. It's his birthday today, turned one. He was at the workshop with him this weekend. It was really enjoy. I, I enjoyed that a lot for a lot of reasons, but Chief did excellent. But when Chief was home with me over spring break, which was about two months ago, so he was about 10 months old, he blinked on a few dummies and that surprised me. He's not been hold conditioned, but he blinked on a few dummies and I think he blinked on him not because he's a bad retriever. He blinked on him because he was uncomfortable with the situation that I was setting him up in. I was way too formal with him. I I expected him to be further than he probably was. I mean, it was all due to my setup. And, and it became a little overwhelming and he blinked on a dummy or two. So hold conditioning really fixes that. If you have a dog that uh, he does not have a habit of that, but he doesn't retrieve enough in the last eight, ten months to, to have developed that habit, which is really good. He's also a really good example of a dog that hasn't done a lot of retrieving and is really, really nice. Um, really, really, um, it, it, there's no concern with me when it comes to his retrieve. He's, he's in a really good spot. So it, it's a, it's a testament to the idea that you don't have to do a, a million retrieves with the dog in the first year. In fact, I don't think you should. He's a real steady dog. Um, he's a real reliable dog. He, if I put him in a bad spot, like I did that week, he showed me that he's got some, some holes. And so we worked on fixing that. But the idea of him going out to get it wasn't the issue. It's what does he do when he gets it in his mouth? What does he, your dog do when it gets it in his mouth? And so you have this GSP that's bumper crazy, quote unquote, pump, bumper crazy and can play, play fetch all day. How does that dog deliver? If it doesn't deliver well, holding it and bringing it straight back to you, not running around. We had a lot of victory laps this weekend. We had a lot of dogs that will get something in their mouth and they really want to parade it to every neighbor within a square mile. And eventually we can these these guys can get them back to them. But we need to fix that. So we need to we need to get this better understanding of what is your job. Your job is to put something in your mouth, and when it's in your mouth, you have one other job, and that's bring it to the person, bring it to your person and hold on to it. So that's what this process does. Um, back to your specific question, Guido, Guido. I think you have an issue with a dog with feathers, it sounds like. So my question goes back to retrieving with dummies and feathers on them. Have you been doing that? I incrementally go, my idea of getting a dog to a bird is feather dummies and I put electrical tape on it. And so that wing can't come off. It's not flapping. It's not flapping. They can't pluck it. Uh, but there's some feather there for the feel of the feather and there's some feathers there for the scent of the feathers. So that's one step. Cold game is what I would start out with. I would start out with a frozen pigeon. And so when the dog, when it comes out, it's hard and it's those feathers, the wings are frozen, the head is frozen. 
it's it's just like a dummy, but it's all feathers and it's actually a bird. And I'd make retrieves at that and make sure that that's all good. Then I might go with some fresh killed game. You know, I'd thaw that bird out. Well, I, I might thaw the bird out. Or I'd go with a fresh killed game. Fresh killed game feels a little different than a thawed out bird because the thawed out bird, I don't have to let it thaw out all the way. I can have it be not frozen solid, but I can have it kind of in the middle. So we can go through that. I can go to fresh killed birds. I can go to live birds that are shackled. I can put a sock over the top of a pigeon so it can't flap its wings, but it's alive and that bird dog knows it. And I can develop that dog holding that. And I can I gauge I can gauge really quick if a dog's got a nice mouth or a hot or, or a hard mouth. I'll find that out pretty early too when you've got dummies and cold game and all that stuff. So if we've got chomping issues, hold conditioning can fix that. If we've got running off, hold conditioning can fix that. If we've got victory laps, hold conditioning can fix that. If we've got blinking, hold conditioning can fix that. That's why I do hold conditioning. I don't do hold conditioning to teach dogs to retrieve. I don't do hold conditioning to teach a bird dog to, to pick up a bird and not pluck the feathers. That's a totally different thing. So I go through retrieving first and get a nice retrieve or the best retrieve I can get until I have to do hold conditioning. Chief hasn't been hold conditioned yet, and I don't think he'll need to be for a while. I had someone say to me, do you think that dog will even need to be hold conditioned? Because, I mean, he delivers really well. He chin, he's got a nice chin up. He, he wants to bring it to Mason. Um, he never spits it. You know, he blinked on it when he was uncomfortable. So I do think he will need it because he's got he's to get past that. And I think that there's probably a little bit of polish that he could put on on that dog's delivery. But his hold conditioning will probably take a week or two tops. Like it's just going to go really smoothly if he does it well. Um, if you watch our series, Bella Be Good, Bella needed to get hold conditioned because she started, at one point she started running past me. That was all she would do. She'd, she would come in with such momentum and speed, she'd blow by me. She'd go, um, you know, she'd be probably 10, 15 yards past me. And then I'd have to call her back to me. And I and I I bitched about it for about three weeks, probably, maybe even longer. And oh, I got a whole condition. I gotta stop that. I gotta stop that. I just it got annoying. And so finally I just said, enough's enough. And I think she was I think she was at least a year. She's probably a little bit over a year. I'd say most of my dogs, I used to hold condition them earlier. Um, you, you have to do it after they're done teething. You can't do it before they're done teething. Mentally, they're just not prepared for it. Physically, they're not prepared for it. But I think I used to probably do it in a window of like eight to 10 months more often than not, but it was because I had to, in order to take the next steps retrieving, I had to. Nowadays, I'm probably closer to a year to 14 months that I'm going through hold with them because I'm paying way more attention to it from day one, retrieve one than I ever have. I used to not pay as much attention. And when I say pay attention, I mean like encourage a good delivery from the very beginning. Encourage them to hold it rather than take it away from them. Share it back and forth with them. This is one thing that, you know, the idea of the dog lurching out and grabbing it, I don't like, but the idea of a dog bringing it to me, me taking it from them eventually, and then giving it right back to them and sharing it back and forth, I think that's a great way to avoid bad habits. I don't want them, I don't want them possessively grabbing it from me. I, I, I think that's, so I don't want them to take it on their terms. I want them to take it on my terms. I want them to offer it back to them. Say, here, you brought it to me. I'll give it back to you. You want to give it to me? I'll give it back to you. So I probably pay way more attention to it early on now than I ever have. And that's making it a lot easier down the road. I also think that the dogs themselves make a big difference. I think some dogs have a really natural, nice delivery, a really good mouth really soft mouth, a real willingness to share with you. It's a cooperative behavior. I think that's genetic to a big degree. And I think over the last five years, I've touched some of the best dogs I've touched in the last 25 years. So I think that that really makes big, big differences in positive ways. Um, the other thing, I've, I'll wrap this up because the other thing that I think is really important and I, we, we had some real good hold, um, conversations this weekend at the workshop because every dog needed it and some of them were ready for it and some of them weren't but they're all going to need it and the one thing that I think and you bring it up here is 
If possible, I'd like to avoid the ear pinch toe hitch method, which is force fetch or trained retrieve. I would agree with you on that because now I don't, I don't, I've never done it that way. So I can't say that it, it will or won't. But one thing I know it does when we do hold conditioning is I come away from it feeling way more connected to my dog. And I, I think that connection and that trust is really, really, really important, especially when you start asking them to do things in stressful situations. When I say stressful, it could be a, a variety of things from a pressure standpoint, but some of it could be distance. Some of it could be um, the terrain, in new areas, new environments that are awkward and uncomfortable for both you and your dog. Like, I think that the stronger your bond and connection with your dog is, the better things go. And when I get through hold conditioning, I've never felt closer to the dog. I don't think I've felt more connected to the dog. I don't think the dog has felt more connected to me and trusting and believing in, in me. Our eyes get better together. Um, obviously, the delivery is a lot better, which takes a lot of frustration away. It's real frustrating when I have a friend of mine, one of my best friends, and he's one of our trainers. He's part of our trainer's crew here. He has not finished hold conditioning with his dog, and he, he, he admits it. He knows it. And it's probably one of the most frustrating things for him when it comes to working with his dog is his dog's delivery. It's not the worst, but it's not the best. And so every time we work together, I see it come up. I see it become an issue. He knows it. He says it. And he hasn't he hasn't fixed it yet. But it also, you know, it's not as big of a deal when he's hunting. It's probably less of an issue when he's hunting. Dog delivers better on the in the field. He's happy with that. But what what gets it with the thing that the reason I think it would be so much better for him if he just sucked it up and did it. It's, it takes work. It takes time. If he just did it, every time we work the dogs together, we get, we do some really nice things. And then we always end it with what? A delivery. So if you ask your dog to go through hell and back to get a dummy for you, if you ask your dog to do some really challenging things that are uncomfortable and awkward for it, if you do all that stuff and the dog does it, in the, in Guido's situation, if you, if you your dog is steady and quiet and you shoot a bird and or you point a bird, flush a bird, shoot a bird, everything goes good. All the pieces fall in place, whether you're training or hunting. And then the dog goes out and gets the bird and won't pick it up, won't bring it back, doesn't deliver it nicely, runs away, whatever it is, ends the retrieve with a real sloppy delivery. Before it's over, you're upset or frustrated or disappointed. And your dog is recognizes that. So what did you end your session on? Frustration, negative. How do you end that positively? Like the one of the best ways to end anything is with a nice smooth delivery. You know how nice it is to put a dog up after that? Like everything went good in the session. Maybe there were some hard points in the session. Maybe some things didn't go well. Maybe you had to help the dog find whatever it was that it had to find. Maybe you took advantage of that and got learn something from it and the dog learns something from it. That would be the goal. But if you can end it and get through all that stress and end it with a nice final pick and brought to me and delivered it nice and I took it from him, that's just such a nice way to wrap it and end it and put the dog up and be like, we got it. We got to win. But if it, if it always ends with frustration, anger, hollering, that's how you put the dog away. That's how you end the session. That's the note you you wrap things up on. And it's just, I just don't think that's the, that's the thing that we want to be doing. So um, so Guido, you, your end of your set question here says, any suggestions? Is there a video in particular I should be watching? So it's a great, a, a, a great lead into this. My suggestions are what I just said. In addition to look through the podcast list, I bet you we've done 10 of them on hold conditioning. Some of them are going to sound a lot like this. Some of them are going to have a little bit different variation. Some of them are going to be specific to other people's questions. But we've talked about hold conditioning an awful lot on our podcast. 
Then I would say go to our training library on our website. It's free. And go to the free videos and go to the hold conditioning tab. And then you're going to see, I think the guys are up to like four different dogs, four or five different dogs that we have filmed. The process just happened to film it over the years when we started hold conditioning to just to, I, some of them are relatively incomplete, which is a little frustrating. And we're working on that right now. We've got some, some things that we're working on finalizing even more information that's even more polished and um, probably I would call it a little more professionally done. But we also have in that video library, and I think it's an hour long, real formal, formally produced hold conditioning video that is free. Uh, we used to sell it. I, I, I don't think we sell it on the website anymore because I think we decided it was just so important and so many people needed it. We said, let's just, let's not sell it. Or let, let's, yeah, let's not sell it. So I think it's free, but it's produced. It was produced by a production team that we, a production company that we worked with when we filmed our shed videos, our puppy videos, and our foundation videos, which are all digitally available to download. And they're also available on DVD. But that one is in that library. Then there's, I don't know, Ben, ben has pulled together. I should look at the number of hours, but hold conditioning itself, we've shared probably, it's got to be over 100 hours of video. Now that's a lot, and that's probably too much for some people. I get it. But there's a whole bunch of information for you, Guido. Watch as much of it as you can. And then realize that of the four or five dogs that we did, they're all a little different. So my sequence is a little different. Um, how they handle it is a little different. It, it's just there's some real nice variations there. We got two puppies in right now. We've got a setter in right now that we're filming. We're working on improving on that. And we're working on actually putting together another option for people as far as getting information from us. So that's in the works. But I can't, I, I would say hold is probably one of the biggest things we've shared um, volumes and volumes and volumes of information on. So check that out on our free training library. It's on our website, dogbonehunter.com. That's it, guys. I really appreciate this question, Guido. I think, I hope this helps you with your answer. And I, I'm going to send you an email and let you know that we recorded a podcast. Ben will get it up. Um, I think we've got a podcast or two that's going to go in between this this one and where we're at right now. Um, regarding the puppy series that we are currently filming. Um, so, but it'll be live pretty quick. And it was a great question. I hope this helps some other people. Um, if you guys would do me a favor, we don't ask a lot. We don't, we try not to bore you with, with, um, brought to you buys and sponsored buys and all that stuff. It's intentional. I don't want to use this as that type of a platform, but I do occasionally I'm going to ask for something in return. And so one of the things I'm going to ask you is if you would do a, me the favor, would you subscribe to the podcast and leave us a comment or a review wherever you're listening to it? It helps me better understand what, what people like, what people don't like. It also helps us grow to other people that we, that are, that the podcast apps think it might fit, might be a fit for. So by you helping me out with that, it, it really is the best way for a, a small business and a small podcast like ours to grow. And, and we would really appreciate if you do that. Also, check out our YouTube channel. Check out our training library. Subscribe to that stuff. Turn your notifications on. It's really the only way. I, I, told, I talked to the guys recently, and they are putting so much information out so frequently on our YouTube channel, which I love, and it's something that we wanted to do. But we're almost like to the point where it's so much that – it becomes a little overwhelming. So we're cutting back a little bit on the volume of it. We're still producing it at a rate that's pretty incredible. We have a, we're going to have a ton of a, a, a big library of stuff, um, backlog to be able to post. But we want to put it out there in increments that are digestible. Um, we want to focus on growing some of the specific series that we're doing because we're doing several of them right now. And I think that they water each other down. So we're going to be, we're going to be working on that on our own, on our end. But if you would do me a favor of subscribing and turning the notifications on, which I think is just clicking on that little bell, it's turn the notifications on. That would help us as well with growing that platform because between our website, our YouTube, our Instagram, our Facebook, this podcast, um, it's a hell of a lot of spots to be trying to keep tabs of, but we're going to do our best. We're doing our best. 
Um, and I appreciate that support more than you know. So um, thank you. We'll uh, continue to, to record these. The guys are continuing to take, we're, we've been recording several with other people um, that I've been posting about a little bit where those are. Please be sure to check out those podcasts as well. Um, and we'll continue to crank them out for you. So thank you so much. We'll talk to you soon. Mm-hmm.